Hi, this is Father Bill W., uh, and I want to welcome you to our podcast. I am a, an Episcopal priest living here in Austin, Texas, where I've just celebrated 46 years in recovery for, uh, from alcoholism. And uh, I want to say that I'm really grateful to God for that and to the fellowship and uh, to so many people who have uh, helped me along the way. I, I don't think any of us... Uh, really is able to get sober by ourselves. That's uh, been my experience. So uh, that community has been a great help to me uh, in my journey. Hope you've had a chance to visit our website. It's uh, twowayprayer.org, and it gives you step-by-step instructions for practicing the 11th step in the way the pioneers in AA had first been introduced to it. I've been doing two-way prayer now for Uh, just over 25 years. It's totally changed my life, and I've seen it uh, changing the lives of many, many others in the fellowship. So if you haven't visited there, I hope you'll do that in the very near future. In this series, uh, we're going through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we're doing it from the perspective of those same pioneers. See, they worked a much simpler and uh, some might argue, a more effective program. Um, actually, it was in the period before the steps were uh, initiated in when the big book came out in 1939. But many, many people were getting sober um, in that f- among those first 100 people or so. And uh, they didn't have steps, but they did have a program. And my belief is that if we look at... Uh, the program they were working, the manner in which they approached what became the steps, uh, we get a, a real clear indication of how, uh, how those steps came about, and I think a much simpler way of working them. Dr. Bob said, keep it simple, and uh, I'm all for that. So in this episode, we are now up to uh, step two. It says, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves, could restore us to sanity. And um, I'd like to kind of back into this step. Um, I want to take the sanity part first and deal with that, and we'll leave the belief in the power uh, to a little bit later in the episode. Um, Now, uh, in thinking about presenting this, uh, I was reminded of a counselor and friend I had, his name was Floyd Lawton, and uh, Floyd was um, also my sponsor in uh, my early times in AA, and Floyd had uh, spent some 11 years of his life living on Skid Row in Detroit. (laughs) He described himself as a very tough case, and uh, and he was, but um, that experience was uh, priceless for him because it taught him a lot of things about himself. And particularly, I think he learned a lot about the human ego, how difficult it is to overcome that in recovery. And that's something that I struggle with and uh, everybody that I work with in the program has uh, ego issues, shall we say. Uh, And I knew that Floyd could be a really good teacher for me when when he told me this story about uh, how one winter he was there on the street and uh, there were three guys uh, living in an abandoned area there. And each of them had his own um, refrigerator box. And one fellow had a hot point in which he was going to spend the winter and Another guy had a Kelvinator, and uh, he was happy with that. And um, Floyd had a double door Amana. And, and he said, Bill, I actually felt so much superior to those other people. And, and as soon as he told me that story, I said, well, this is a man that I can learn something about egos from and how they operate. Uh, So uh, Floyd wound up uh, being the counseling director at uh, an alcohol and drug treatment facility where I got sober back in 1972. And uh, part of of being there in that uh, facility, 
there was a requirement that uh, each of the counselors deliver a lecture on the steps. And every day they had a step lecture on one of the 12 steps. And um, um, when I was there as a, as a patient, um, I, I'd listen to them and and fellow would come in uh, and, and he'd start in on step six or nine or whatever the step might be. Uh, but every time Floyd came in to... Uh, to give a lecture on a, on any step, he always started back at step one. And what he said to us was, the steps are like a ladder. And you don't approach a ladder, you don't start on the middle rung of a ladder. You always start with the first step. And if, if that first step is taken properly, you, you, you can uh, go up the ladder. Uh, but if it's not, uh, it isn't going to work. So um, I think in, in, uh, in memory of Floyd, um, I want to do a, a quick review of step one before we jump into the second step. I'll only take a, a minute or two with this, but uh, I, I really think Floyd was right. It, it's important. Uh, uh, you go in there and you start uh, looking at step two and... Uh, Really, the question is, what's the shape of your ego when uh, when you are approaching that step? So a uh, quick review would run something like this. Two key words in the step. First word is powerless. And uh, as I said in, in our first episode, that refers to the physical element of the, um, of, of the illness. So that I'm powerless over alcohol means simply that when I drink, I don't stop drinking. I drink too much. And, uh, and that is because of uh, an allergic reaction that I have. And, and that is that uh, alcohol triggers craving with me so that one drink isn't enough and a um, hundred aren't enough either. So uh, off, off I go. So that's the physical part of the illness. And and Floyd taught me, you know, always main, always uh, focus on um, powerlessness being the physical part. Not that I'm powerless over people, places, and things. That's it's very different. Um, I have to treat it with with great respect. That um, I cannot take alcohol into my system, or I know what the results are going to be. And the second part of the step is that our lives had become unmanageable. And that's the tricky one um, in step one. And what that means is that, um, is, that, is that I cannot manage my life. I cannot manage whether I'm going to take that drink or not take that drink. Um, so so the, the big book talks about the mental obsession and I would place that in the area of unmanageability. My life is unmanageable. I have this, this uh, part of me in my unconscious that drives me back to drinking. And so my life is unmanageable when? Not when I'm drinking. It's my life is unmanageable when I'm not drinking. So I'm 46 years uh, sober. Uh, Today is actually my anniversary, and uh, I have great respect for this illness, that um, if I let my guard down, if I let go of my spiritual connection, that in insane thought uh, that I can drink again successfully uh, has a chance to creep back into my mind and then take me back to doing the very thing that is doing me in. And I went ahead and I used the word there that we meet in step two, uh, insane. I hope uh, no one takes offense at that. Uh, uh, it was a tough one for me to swallow. Uh, but very logically, if you're going to talk in step two about being restored to sanity, well, then logically, you have to have some insanity to be restored from. And where does that insanity lie? It lies in step one. 
Where in step one? In the part that my life is unmanageable. Uh, so I uh, hope you were able to follow that because um, um, it's really important. It, it, there is that hopeless element that that step one brings to us, you know? And if, and if, if, if I don't feel hopeless, I'm not ready for step two because step two becomes my hope. Hope for the hopeless. And that's, that's that land, that, that moving from step one into step two. So, um, so there, there's a little review of, of, of the step. Uh, hope Floyd enjoyed that. Um, probably didn't do a good job as, as he would have done, but uh, that's okay. Floyd's very forgiving. So step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So we want to talk just a little bit about sanity. Um, and that is, um, you know, um, well, there was, there was a fellow by the name of Tom Powers. I don't know if uh, too many of you know about him. Tom, um, his sponsor was Bill Wilson. Uh, he was from New York, and um, Tom um, really knew most of the uh, early pioneers. He, he stumbled in and out of AA for a few years, finally got sober in the early 40s, um, and Wilson sponsored him. Um, and he went on. He was, he was a great writer. He helped Wilson write the 12 and 12, helped him write AA Comes of Age, uh, and also the second edition of the big book. Um, Tom worked a really, really serious program. He made a point of saying, you know, some people have really got to work a serious program. Uh, can't cut them too much slack. You know, some people come into AA uh, or any 12-step program, and, you know, they're not maybe of the hopeless variety. They can get by with... Uh, with uh, doing a little of this, a little bit of that, kind of take the steps cafeteria style. Uh, he was not one of those kind. He was a, a rip roar and alcoholic who had to work the steps very seriously, and, and he did that. Actually, started a program uh, later on called All Addicts Anonymous. I invite you to visit their website. It was a way of living, living out the program. Uh, in a communal way. They, they bought some property in upstate New York, and um, about 60, 70 of them, I'm not sure the exact number, came from all around the country and bought homes there on that property, lived there as a community, uh, trying to live by the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Tom wrote uh, a lot of material about that, and um, he gave a talk in 1961 uh, in Virginia, and he focused in that talk on the word uh, sanity. And he makes a big issue that that is really the promise of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, he, and he describes getting restored to sanity. See, that's what the steps are about. They are about, about healing that part of me that is insane. Again, like the big book says, the problem is in the mind. It's not that I'm allergic to alcohol. Big deal, I'm allergic to alcohol. You could say I'm allergic to um, uh, arsenic. But you know what? Arsenic does not give me any trouble. I stay the hell away from arsenic. I do not have to go to Arsenic Anonymous because I don't fool with it. I recognize that I am powerless over it. That's what they're trying to tell us in the, in the big book when they give the story of the, uh, the jaywalker. <clears throat> the message really is he's powerless over cars and trucks and fire engines. He's powerless over them. And that's not a problem. His problem starts when he likes to experience the excitement of pulling his foot back from the curb just as that car is coming close. And the closer it comes, the greater the thrill he has. <laughs> and so he lands in the hospital 
And they say, listen, fella, you're powerless over cars. Stay the hell away from them. But as soon as he gets out, that insane thought creeps back into his head. And so um, I want you to hear this um, this part of this talk. Um, it's just about a five-minute uh, portion. Um, and and I, I think you'll uh, get something really powerful out of that, maybe a new appreciation of um, what it is the program has to offer us. So this is, uh, this is Tom Powers. My name is Tom Powers, and I'm an alcoholic. The things that this program gives a person are many. But it's important among the many to pick out the first things, and particularly the most reliable things. Because some of the things that this program gives to a man or a woman are marginal. They're great, but they're marginal. And some of the things are great, and they're not marginal, they're basic. And I think it's tremendously important to sort these things out, and it's very easy to do so because the program spells it out. These aren't my ideas. I'm talking off the card now. You hear people come in here and say, well, I got sober. I got my health back. That's great. And I don't want to sell health short. But it's marginal. Some people come in here and don't get their health back. Or you may get it back and lose it again. Some people come in here and they say, well, I got sober and, uh, gee, four years went by and I'm, I'm rich again or I'm loaded. And that's fine. It's nice to have some money in your pocket again. But it's marginal. It's a byproduct. It's very nice. I love a book as well as the next guy. But one must be very careful to recognize that this is not basic in AA. It's one of the lovely byproducts. There are some things that are even closer to the core that are still marginal. Like serenity. Serenity is a very nice thing to have. If you've been at war with yourself for 15 or 20 years, it's a little touch of paradise. It's a foretaste of what lies ahead. But it's marginal. The mark of the marginal thing is it comes and goes. It's nice, but you can't rely on it. And if you do rely on it, you may be let down. And if you're not careful, you may run around saying you haven't got the program. Nonsense. You can be broke and sick and upset as hell and still be on the program. The program specifically offers not wealth, not health, not serenity, but sanity. That isn't marginal. That's root, basic, and that you can count on. And if your health happens to desert you, and if your money happens to go, and if you happen to be all loused up mentally and emotionally in every other way, if you're on this program, the sanity is still there, and you won't run, you won't lie, and you won't drink. That's sanity. Because an alcoholic who drinks is nuts. These are basics. And an alcoholic who doesn't drink one day at a time is sane. I don't care what the rest of his state is like. I think it's terribly important to hang on to the core of this program because the winds of life still blow. After you're sober, and after you're sober a long time, you can hit a, a spot in your life that'll make you look back to your drinking days and wonder if it was ever this rough. But this program gives a man or a woman something that never deserts them that doesn't blow with the winds because it's connected with the eternal sanity, the ability to stand up and live one day at a time. 
like a man, like a woman, like a human being. And to take the blows of life, and they come to all of us without acting unworthily. And for an alcoholic, that means without taking that first drink. Well, I hope uh, you enjoyed that recording as uh, as much as I did. Um, some powerful messages in there, some, some very simple ways of approaching uh, this step. Uh, what I, one of the way, main things I took away from it was um, it took me back to where I was in my first year of recovery. And that was, uh, I didn't know much about God's will uh, at that time, but what I was quite sure of was God's will was don't drink. <laughs> I, I could bet everything on that. And, and the second thing in my case that was, and I, and I knew this, was don't run. I was a runner. I was big on the geographical cure. And uh, I got sober in Detroit, and and uh, I didn't want to be there. I, there were many, many other places I, I wanted to go to, but I knew if I did, uh, that was the end. So don't run. And the third, uh, as Tom says, is don't lie. Uh, Tom was very big on the honesty part of the program, as was were the, uh, uh, the folks who were teaching me uh, the basics of AA when I came in. Boy, they made a big thing of honesty, and I was a liar. And uh, I had to come around to that way of, of living. And what Tom says is, you know, God is found in the truth. And most of us addicts are pretty far from the truth. So getting restored to sanity. Um, I'm, a, I'm a special kind of nut. I'm not the kind of nut that belongs in the state hospital. But I am the kind of nut that uh, the thought of drinking uh, continues to come up from my unconscious. And if I'm not spiritually connected, um, if I'm not in touch with God, um, I will act on that. So um, let's move on then to um, understanding what it means by the power greater than self. And I have to say that I, I wasted a great deal of time. Uh, with this part of step two, I thought it was necessary for me to find a higher power, to name that power, and to establish a working relationship with that power. I thought all of that was incorporated in step two. Um, the good news was uh, it is really not uh, necessary. Like most addicts, I, I didn't have a working relationship with God. I wasn't even sure that God existed. And, and that's fine. And that's some really, really good news for a lot of people out there who stumble over the God part of the program. It isn't necessary to, to believe. It's only necessary to, um, to, to not be sure of the opposite. You know, uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. But so anyway, this is where the history, I think, can, can really be of some great help. The Oxford group, they had what they called an experiment of faith. Um, and that experiment um, was, are you willing to, to entertain an hypo a hypothesis? Uh, uh, you know, this could be true. It may not be true. I don't know. It's the open-mindedness that the, the program asks us to have. That the only reason this thing won't work is if we close our mind to the possibility. So it's asking, is it, is it a possibility? Um, and that's really the basis for step two. Um, does God exist? Is it possible? And if God does exist, uh, could he do for me what I cannot do for myself? Very, very simple. Shoemaker, uh, Sam Shoemaker, who taught Bill steps two to 11, Wilson said, uh, says a couple of things that are, I think, uh, pertinent uh, in understanding this step. He says this, any honest person can begin the spiritual experiment by surrendering as much of himself as he can to as much of God as he understands. He goes on to say, faith is not sight. It's not knowing for sure. It is a high gamble. 
There are only two alternatives here. God is or he isn't. You leap one way or the other. It is a risk to bet everything you have on God. So is it a risk not to? And so that's that's the point we come to in, uh, in step two. Uh, am I going to do this thing or am I not going to do this thing? Am I going to enter into the experiment or am I going to sit back and judge? And uh, all it takes is a willingness to go into the laboratory uh, uh, and test the hypothesis. Uh, and the hypothesis gets broken down in the re remaining steps. Uh, but I've got to choose to do it uh, with an open mind. A great example of this comes from uh, Clarence Snyder. And Clarence Snyder was one of the AA pioneers from uh, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, his story appears in the first three editions of the big book. It's under the title of Home Brewmeister. Uh, for some reason, it was left out of the fourth edition. Um, hope Clarence doesn't get a resentment over that. But anyway, Clarence goes uh, to Akron. Uh, he's sent there by his wife because she has heard that there's this doctor down there, uh, Dr. Bob uh, Smith, who's uh, doing some miraculous things with alcoholics. And God knows she had tried everything in her power to get um, um, Clarence sober, and it didn't work. So he goes down there uh, to Akron, uh, but Bob wasn't sure that Clarence was ready for the program. He thought he might have been too young, hadn't suffered enough. <laughs> uh, here's Clarence, his, his response to that. He says, I was down to 135 pounds, no job, no clothes, and no money. I didn't know how much more ready I could be. Still, I had to convince them I was ready. Uh, so Bob quizzed him on his drinking problem to see if he was ready now for a spiritual approach. And when Bob was convinced that he was ready, he took him through step what became step two in less than a minute. So here's Clarence in his own words recalling the questions that Dr. Bob asked him. Do you believe in God, young fella? He always called me young fella. When he called me Clarence, I knew I was in trouble. What does that have to do with it? Everything, he said. Uh, I guess I do. Guess nothing. Either you do or you don't. Yes, I do. That's fine, Dr. Bob replied. Now we're getting someplace. All right. Get out of bed and on your knees. We are going to pray. He, he took Clarence from step two to step three in under one minute. So if I landed in uh, in Akron and uh, back in the in the thirties there, and Bob was uh, my physician, here's a little script I wrote uh, in terms of how he might explain step two uh, to me. It's really very simple, he'd say. Do you believe, or are you at least willing to believe that there might be a God? You don't have to be sure there's a God. You don't have to know it for certain. You just have to admit to God's being a theoretical possibility. That's all you need to begin. Now, just one more question and we'll be done. This God, who you admit might exist, could he possibly have the power to relieve you of your alcoholism? I'm not saying that he would, mind you, only that if he existed, could he do that? Yes, of course, you'd hear me say. If there's a God, then God could do that. Congratulations, the old man would say to me. That's all there is to it. God might exist, and if he does exist, then he might help you. Simple, isn't it? Now let's kneel down here next to your bed, and let me hear you say an honest prayer, asking this God who might exist for help, because without him, kid, you're really screwed. <laughs> so. Here is uh, step two in a nutshell. Do I really need to be restored to sanity? <clears throat> if I answer no to that, then I need to go back to step one. Or as the big book recommends, and, and it's not being sarcastic when it says this. It says go out and do some more drinking. 
Because if we're not convinced of step one, step two will be meaningless. But if I am convinced, uh, and if you are convinced, then there are just two questions that really should constitute uh, step two. Is it possible there could be a God? And if I answer yes to that, then the second question is this. Could God, if God existed, give me the sanity I need not to pick up that drink? Does he have that power? That's all it takes. Answering those two questions. Uh, Do that, and then like Clarence, you're done with this step. And then it's on to step three. So step two, if you're wasting more than uh, a minute on this step, uh, you're wasting time. It's keeping you out of uh, recovery. You just ask those questions. If your answer is yes, you move on. So uh, I told you Bob (laughs) insisted on making it simple, and I don't know if you can make it any more simple than that. So I hope this uh, little lesson on, on step two was helpful. Appreciate your listening. God bless, and keep coming back.